Laurent, over to you. Thank you. Quake Askina, hello, bonjour à tous. My name is Laurent Ojik. I'm an Algonquin from Kirigan Zibi, and I'm also the general director of the CIRCAC, which is an indigenous uh, housing provider in the province of Quebec. As a board member of uh, the National Indigenous Collaborative Housing Corporation, NICHI, I'm very ex excited to introduce uh, NICHI's first webinar, a uh, webinar that'll give you a better understanding of who NICHI is and how we can support indigenous housing providers that offer safe, affordable, appropriate, and dignified housing to indigenous people and their families. Alors, bonjour à tous. Je m'appelle Laurent Ojik. Je suis un Algonquin de Créan Zibi. Je suis directeur général de la Société mobile du recrutement des centres d'amitié autochtones du Québec. En tant que membre du conseil d'administration de Nietzsche, je suis très heureux de vous introduire à son premier webinaire. Un, web un webinaire qui vous permettra de mieux comprendre euh, qui est Nietzsche et euh, comment cette organisation peut soutenir les fournisseurs de logements autochtones qui offre du logement sécuritaire, abordable, approprié et digne aux peuples autochtones et à leurs familles. Donc, uh, today, today's agenda, uh, first, we'll, uh, we'll introduce Nietzsche. Uh, afterwards, after, after we'll, uh, we'll, we'll move along with the purpose of its first funding allocation program. Uh, then we're going to talk about the outcomes and we're going to have a period of uh, questions and answers that are of more or less 15 minutes. So the whole webinar is supposed to last a maximum of one hour. Euh, donc, à l'agenda, euh, nous, nous allons commencer, débuter par l'introduction de Nietzsche, euh, l'objectif de l'allocation des fonds de son premier programme de financement. Euh, par la suite, nous allons parler des résultats et nous aurons aussi également une période de questions de 15 minutes. Uh, due to the large number of attendees, uh, we're very happy to have uh, so many people attending the, 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 our first webinar. Uh, however, due to the short amount of time, the mic won't be open, so please use the Q&A icon. Uh, to drop your questions there, if we can get all of the questions uh, answered during the live sessions, uh, we, we're going to be able to provide the answers there on the uh, directly on Nietzsche's website. And uh, there's also going to be a link to the webinar that's uh, presently being recorded. Donc, en raison du grand nombre de participants uh, et du peu de temps disponible que nous avons pour uh, l'ensemble des questions-réponses, uh, on vous invite à utiliser l'icône le, le, de questions uh, Q&A pour déposer vos questions. Euh, puis, si on n'a pas le temps à la fin de, du webinaire de répondre à l'ensemble des questions, euh, l'information les réponses seront disponibles directement sur le site web de Nietzsche. Et euh, le webinaire est présentement aussi enregistré. Donc, euh, bonne, euh, bon webinaire à tous. Uh, it's now a pleasure to pass along the microphone to Jeff Lukes and Jimmy Gantz, who will take over for the rest of the webinar. Il me fait plaisir de passer le micro à M. Jeff Lukes et à Jimmy Gantz, qui vous présenteront la suite du webinaire. Merci, Laurent. Um, en bonjour. M. Gando, Demning Dao, M. Sagi Ganeshnabe, Kamadesh Kurian, uh, and Nujaba, Hiawatha First Nation, Jeff Lukes and Dishnikas. Good morning, good afternoon, and welcome, everyone, and uh, thank you for being here. Um, as Laurent said, my name is Jeff Lukes. I am a Turtle Clan from uh, the Hiawatha First Nation, M. Sagi's of Rice Lake. Uh, and I'm sitting today in uh, Rama territory, uh, the Mississaugas, uh, Chippewas of Rama, uh, where I'm uh, attending the, the acknowledgement and the um, centennial of the signing of our Williams Treaty in 1923. So it's a, a special day for me on two fronts to be able to be part of this webinar and, and uh, uh, provide information and, and uh, respond to your questions and, and your issues. And at the same time, participate with my community and the six other Williams Treaty First Nations as we acknowledge 100 years since uh, the signing of the Williams Treaty Territory, or the Williams Treaty uh, uh, Sub-Resolution. Um, I want to give you a bit of a history, uh, talk a bit about the purpose of, uh, of Nietzsche and what we're doing. And then I'm going to turn it over to, uh, to Jamie, and Jamie's going to talk about the other pieces that are happening here on the short term, and as well as some of the long-term view and, and the work that she's been doing on helping to um, pre present Nietzsche um, uh, in the right, uh, in the right uh, manner and to be able to uh, talk about what the long term looks like for us. So let me start with a bit of history. Um, we're almost, well, we're 11 months, almost 12 months since Nietzsche was first formed. It came together in November of 2022 uh, as a result of a number of Indigenous housing organizations coming together and saying that we needed to provide a, a response to Canada with respect to the $300 million that was announced in budget 2022. And uh, we need to provide a, a unified and, and a, and a coalesced uh, front on uh, how we should be able to 
um, take uh, um, the, the funding and, and provide an Indigenous focused and Indigenous response to the needs of uh, Indigenous organizations across Canada. That was November. In December, we were incorporated. In January, uh, the work started on, cre on producing or, or, or creating a business case to uh, present to Canada, uh, where Nietzsche would take on the responsibility for the $281.5 million that was left out of, uh, or allocated out of budget 22 for urban, rural, and Northern communities. We worked on that business case over a number of months. Uh, Treasury board approval came to us in uh, late May of this past year. And in June, the funding announcement was made and uh, we were able to uh, secure the funding to be able to do uh, over the next two fiscal years, what Canada has asked us to do with respect to addressing the urgent and unmet needs of, um, of indigenous people living away from their traditional communities. So 281 and a half million out of 4.3 billion that was allocated in budget 22. Um, we know that 281.5 million is not enough. We know that it uh, is about uh, five and a half billion short of what was suggested in the budget submissions where we were talking around $6 billion a year over 10 years. But we have 281 and we have it for the next two fiscal years. And we have over that period of time, um, the, the requirement to address urgent and unmet needs and to do that in a fair and equitable manner. Those are the only two conditions that Canada put in place. The rest of it is an indigenous approach. It is what we have been calling and what you are aware of the phrase for indigenous by indigenous. Prior to this has been for indigenous by government. And this is a unique approach. And this is an opportunity for us uh, as indigenous people, an opportunity for us as indigenous organizations to change the way in which this type of funding is, uh, is used, to change the way in which the decisions are made and to create a, a positive and a proactive approach to what the future can look like when Indigenous people are actively and uh, in encouragingly involved in creating the, the, the frameworks in creating the, and making the decisions and in creating the path forward. So we're very excited to be able to do that. We have, as I said, uh, received our funding in June. And since then, we've been working uh, very diligently to put all of the pieces together um, from org the organization itself and standing up Anichi, uh, putting staff in play the last few months have been very busy doing that um, so we now are getting the organizational structure built and we are now ready to move forward with the, creating the allocation process and webinar this this webinar will touch a little bit about that webinar two will provide more for you in a way of what the application looks like and more specific details on the process as we go forward but basically within one year we will have gone from what was the genesis of an idea to bring together Indigenous housing organizations from coast to coast to coast, to create a national entity to be able to take funding on a for Indigenous, by Indigenous framework, and to be able to get those funding out to the uh, to uh, the organizations across the across the country, we will be able to do that in a year. We will have done in twelve months what hasn't been done in twelve years. In in I would say a head state to say twelve decades. But it's been a long time coming, and it's a, this is a, a unique approach, but an important approach, and one that uh, I'm, I'm glad to see so many people have, uh, have agreed that it's something they want to be part of, and they want to, uh, to work with us to make this, uh, make this a reality. I apologize for the delay in getting this information out to you. Um, as I said, we received our funding in, um, in June, and we've been working very hard to make sure that we can put this organization together Put the process and the framework together and be able to um, and to be able to create that national voice um, but here we are in less than a year uh, as i say ready to start the allocation process and ready to begin um, trying to find ways in which to move the money out meeting that uh, the two criteria the two principal criteria of addressing urgent and unmet needs in a fair and equitable distribution fair and equitable manner um, so all that work has gone into place we are now ready to figure out um, the process or to uh, describe the process uh, on how the allocation will be handled and to be able to provide you with a lot of the information that you're going to need uh, as you move forward in this. Let me talk about one of the other things that we've done here recently that's important to note as part of the um, allocation process. Um, we have created uh, an advisory council 
made up of seven individuals. And these individuals are housing, uh, experienced housing professional people from across Canada that represent the three Indigenous groups, Métis, Inuit, uh, First Nations. And that advisory council is a totally uh, separate and unique body who has been tasked with creating the, um, the, the framework and helping to define the process uh, for which we'll move forward in creating uh, in in, uh, in the in determining the, the selection and the allocations, um, the advisory council is a totally separate entity, uh, totally separate from the board, uh, and is not connected to uh, to the board of Nietzsche. In fact, we've done our very best to make sure that the board of Nietzsche is as far away from the operations, uh, far away from sorry the work that's going on in this selection process and in the in the development process as possible. And, in, and have used this advisory council very effectively. And we want to thank them for their expertise and for their knowledge in helping to put a lot of these pieces together and in helping to ensure that we have a for Indigenous and a by Indigenous approach. Let me talk a little bit under this history piece about the value of being a part of Nietzsche. Nietzsche is a national voice. Nietzsche is a national organization. We are in, encouraging everyone to be a part of this work. We are encouraging everyone to, to participate with us in this, to support this work that's going on. We know that there will be issues and there will be concerns in various parts of the country. And we know that, that people are always hesitant with change. This is different. This is unique. This is for Indigenous, by Indigenous. And it's an opportunity to take that um, a new approach, to take the, um, the, the potential for transformative change and to be able to create something that is unique for uh, Canada and in many cases for many parts of the world on the way Indigenous people are now involved in managing and uh, creating um, the new, a new funding approach and a new way in which the decisions are being made. So I hope that um, the change that's, that you see is, a, uh, um, you would see it as a positive change because it is. Um, it's just something that will take some time to get used to. It's not the old way of doing things, which we think is a, is good way, a good thing. And it's a new way of approaching it and a way that is uh, with an Indigenous voice, a way that is with an Indigenous focus, and a way that respects our culture, our traditions, as well as meeting the needs of those organizations from coast to coast to coast. So um, the purpose of the organization, if we can go, Jay, after the next slide, I want to talk just a little bit about the purpose. I've talked about where the money came from. The, the 281 and a half is part of Budget 22. Budget 22 announced $4.3 billion, $4 billion and allocated over seven years to First Nations, Inuit and Métis, 300 million set aside for urban, rural and Northern communities. Out of that 300 million, a portion uh, was allocated to CMHC and they are using those fundings, that funding, sorry, for various uh, initiatives and purposes that they have assigned. And the remainder, the 281 and a half is what we have um, for the next two fiscal years. The requirement of Canada is over the next two fiscals, fiscal 23-24 and fiscal 24-25, for us to be able to move all $281.5 million out into uh, the Indigenous pro housing projects in urban, rural, and Northern communities. There, It is not a program that is targeted on reserve. And I know some people have asked about, well, is this a program that we can uh, we can use in our First Nation community? We cannot put the money on reserve. That money uh, targeted on reserve is money that's actually allocated out of the four billion. And I believe out of the four billion, and and uh, I stand to be corrected, roughly two point eight billion was targeted to First Nations. Uh, another portion of that funding was targeted to Inuit, and the remainder of that was targeted to Métis. Uh, the 300 million is the target, uh, is the allocation, sorry, to urban, rural, and northern with 281 and a half to us. We know we will be oversubscribed, but that's a very good thing in many ways because we know that in doing that, in, in seeing that oversubscribed uh, response to the call out for expressions of need, what we are going to see is, is an extensive um, amount of data coming in the door that we can provide to Canada, that we can encourage Canada to use to help um, as they talk about where the longer term uh, goes, uh, sorry, where the, what the longer term, term looks like and the data will be there to support that. I'll leave most of that to Jamie to talk about because it's an area that um, is her expertise. I will say uh, one thing that we have done and you can see the point on the screen, it says the notional allocation for the North. 
we have made sure that that the north is going to be um, uh, respected in the allocation and that there will be funding notionally allocated to the north uh, to ensure that the north is able to address uh, their urgent and unmet needs as well. So um, the next piece for us is to figure out, um, not sure, we have figured out the allocation process. The next piece for us is to figure out the long term. And that's something we'll talk about in a, in a couple of moments. Um, the only thing I would say is that um, as we move forward on this, we will be um, we will be ensuring uh, in, assuring uh, you that we are in contact, that we'll be able to answer your questions, and we'll be able to respond to you as quickly as we can. There will be a lot of information thrown at you over the next uh, few weeks. A lot of questions will come up, and we will respond to those. We will make sure that you get your issues and your questions answered, and we will make sure that we're able to uh, provide you with the um, with the response that you need to be able to assist you as you come in the door with your applications. Uh, but please um, don't uh, don't be alarmed by the, the number or the response. We're encouraged by the number of uh, organizations that are interested in how this will work. And we're hopeful, uh, very hopeful, that uh, Canada will be able to recognize that this for Indigenous, by Indigenous approach to the way in which housing and housing allocations are being done uh, is the right way and the best way forward. So I'm going to stop here because I want to turn it over to Jamie and give Jamie a chance to provide us more information on um, some of the work that's being done on the allocation process, work that she's undertaken uh, with respect to uh, the longer term strategy and, uh, and also provide you some information on the whole allocation process. So Jamie, I'll turn it to you. Thank you, Jeff. Um, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jamie Gauntz. I am actually from Treaty 4 Territory, uh, the Pasqua First Nation. I am visiting the Quebec region. Um, I've only been here for a couple of months and I'm still exploring the beautiful land that is Quebec. Uh, and I appreciate everybody's warm welcome today. Um, I would like to, uh, I've been watching some of the comments come in and I would just like to walk quickly through some of the allocation process and the application process. Um, so when we're looking at urgent and unmet need, there's there are two views in which we're looking at it. Urgent and unmet need for the organization. We understand that the, the organizations, many out there are, are having um, difficulties keeping their doors open or they just don't have enough support to ensure that they have enough staff to support those that need their services. And so we want to hear from you about what the urgent and unmet need is for your organization. We want you to explain it to us, um, share with us some of the challenges that you faced, and of course, some of the successes. And then the urgent and unmet need for those on the ground that are accessing your supports. So when you provide programs and services, what are the urgent and unmet needs that you're seeing on the ground from those individuals that are coming into your organizations and accessing those services and supports? We want to we want to gather this information to better understand what it looks like across Canada and while we're navigating this housing crisis. Um, can you move to the next slide, please? So, um, some of the um, the prerequisites or some of the things that we need from you. We need to make sure you're an Indigenous organization. We also need to ensure that you're a nonprofit organization. We um, have provided an application process that is very simple and straightforward. The questions revolve around urgent and unmet need, again, for your organization or for those that are accessing the supports on the ground. Um, the application itself is, is very simple and it allows the organizations to give us a very clear understanding of what urgent and unmet need looks like. And we understand that across regions, it's going to look different from, for everyone. Um, and so we don't wanna provide a prescriptive approach as to what it looks like for urgent and unmet need across Canada. We want you to tell us what that looks like. Uh, the advisory council, again, is uh, completely separate and they will take a look at the application that comes in and they have a scoring uh, matrix that they will use. And they are looking at first and foremost, urgent and unmet need. And then we're looking at 
um, First Nations, Métis, Inuit, um, who who is accessing the services and supports? Sorry, the little chat box pops up and it distracts me. <laughs> it, it covers up half the screen. Um, and I think what's most important is we want to ensure that we understand what's happening during this housing crisis and what is happening on the ground for, for urban, rural and northern people across Canada. Um, we're collecting this data because we understand that there's very little data that really speaks to the processes, programs, the issues, um, the gaps in service, and the supports that Indigenous people are accessing right now. And we look to the pit count, which um, isn't necessarily a fulsome um, piece of data that we're getting for Indigenous people living in urban, rural, and northern areas. So we want to be able to collect the data, understand the process, understand the gaps, and provide this back to the government so that we can decide, we can say what our people need. Um, we're looking at this as, uh, as step one in ensuring that when we're making this transformational change for our Indigenous people, that we get to decide what happens, what we need, what we see, and how we, we provide the services and supports that our people need. Um, what you need to include in your application is urgent and unmet need um, that you're non uh, that you're an indigenous organization that you're nonprofit and then really the the questions are very very simple they will talk to you about capacity development um, operating development and it will also speak to the housing continuum and where your organization um, fits into the housing continuum. What services do you provide within that housing continuum? And we want to know within that housing continuum, the services that are provided, how does it move the individual through the housing continuum and provides them supports and success? We are truly looking to ensure that Indigenous people are moving out of surviving and into thriving providing them opportunities, safety, and security in their home. That is number one important for us at this time. Um, I don't know, Jeff, is there anything else you would like me to speak to? I think that kind of covers it. I think we've got most of it and I'm looking at the questions that are coming in and uh -huh. I think what's happening is that we'll be able to respond to a number of the questions. Uh, uh -huh. I wanted to clarify a couple of things just to, in my remarks so that it's clear about um, housing on reserve and the north. Um, people have asked us to define the north, and as that's the question that has been asked um, through the advisory council. Let me back up a little bit and talk a bit about the advisory council. As I mentioned at the start, it's a comprised of seven individuals who have been brought together uh, uh, as a result of their housing expertise and their knowledge. Uh, they are also representative of uh, the, indi the distinct Indigenous groups across the country and understand the issues that are being faced at the First Nation, Inuit and Métis level. And so those individuals have been able to bring that awareness and that knowledge to the table and to be able to help uh, describe and define um, what it is that this process should look like, how the process should be uh, rolled out, um, what type of criteria we should be looking at, and what type of funding levels we should uh, we should try to um, uh, to categorize on funding uh, where the funding should be going as priority um, for that for the north the definition is basically Inuit Nunagat, uh, anything outside of that in Northwest Territories and the Yukon um, we know that there are various definitions that are out there as to what is the north um, Statistics Canada uses the definition CMHC uses the definition um, Inuit Nunagat has their own definition as to what describes their territory their lands um, what we have essentially done is we have tried to figure out uh, using that um, that variety of descriptors to say that uh, for us, the North is Inuit Nunagat uh, and anything outside of Inuit Nunagat in Northwest Territories would be um, would be part of that uh, area then outside in the North, as well as the Yukon. That's how we've defined it. Um, and um, and we hope that and believe that uh, that's the right approach to be able to do that. And we're trusting in uh, the, the knowledge and the awareness of uh, those who are part of the advisory council to help us with that. 
We also on the board, uh, we have a board composition of 15 from across Canada, literally representing every coast to coast to coast area of the country and also representations from the north. So we have uh, uh, board members from um, uh, Nunagat, uh, Nunavut, um, from um, uh, far north, uh, NWT. And so we have good representation from the north to be able to uh, make sure that we're, we're respecting the views of the north and have uh, have factored in uh, the issues and and the, and the concerns that exist in the north in the allocation process and in the way that we uh, make the decisions within that. I also want to talk a bit about, about then um, to the advisory council's work. The advisory council is um, uh, the brains of this organization in many ways from the allocation side of things. The, as I said, these are the individuals who have come together to help us put all of those pieces together. Um, they will review the applications. Uh, they will do the scoring, but they will not review the applications um, at the very beginning. We will be using the Canadian Housing Transformation Center sorry, the CHTC, yes, Canadian Housing Transformation Center, uh, to help us uh, with the platform when the applications come in the door. We will provide more information on CHTC's work and show you what that process is in webinar two. But the CHTC will be the vehicle through which we uh, uh, screen the applications. They will be the, be the, uh, the ones uh, bringing them in uh, through the portal um, that will be on the Nietzsche website. They will see the applications. They will be able to screen them for eligibility. They'll be able to screen them for anything that's being missed, anything that may not be available or be uh, be there. They will go back and make contact with uh, the, the applicants on their project to make sure that all the data that is required is in place. And then what will be passed to our um, uh, to the advisory council is an application that has been stripped of all its identifiers. So they're not going to be able to identify who that uh, particular project is, they 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 will not know by name or by location. Uh, they will know uh, roughly the general area of the uh, of the project as part of what part of the country, et cetera. But they will then be able to look at that, um, use the scoring system that's been put in place, and be able to assess that and determine whether that project should be considered for further review uh, and what uh, the next steps will be with that, or if there's more information that's required, whatever. So all along the process, what we're trying to do is make sure that we remove as much as possible any issue with bias, any issue where they could be influenced because of their particular knowledge, their particular local area uh, uh, for both them and for, as I mentioned earlier, the board. Uh, we have kept the board away from all of this process so that the board itself is not involved. There will be questions I know around the funding categories. There are two funding categories involved in this. One is for what's called capital and organizational development up to a million dollars. And the next category is uh, called capital development. And that's for anything over a million up to 10 million. And I know that there's been, been uh, there are concerns around, well, why is it $10 million? And in some projects that uh, that won't work and 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 we, uh, we, can't, we can't maybe use, we need to use more than 10. Um, and the answer to that simply is $10 million is what we, what we've put into the cap because we have 281 and a half. Um, we know that we had mentioned earlier that 281 and a half is not sufficient. If we had much, much more in the way of an allocation uh, budget, we would be able to look at that cap and be able to perhaps increase it. But we've put that cap in place to, in order to be able to make sure that on a national level, we can address as many of those urgent and unmet needs as possible and provide the best service that we can to the organizations who need that funding. It is a national initiative. We need to spread the money across Canada as, as widely and as fairly and equitably as I've said before as we can. So that's why the $10 million cap on the on the second category on capital development is only because we only have 281 and a half and we have to make that dollar go as far as we can. If we had uh, been able to convince Canada to provide us with additional funding, that cap may be higher. And the hope is that if we can convince Canada for the longer term, we can make a change in the way those categories are defined as we move forward. So um, the other question that 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 it, that had come to mind was uh, the, that I've been saying, and I want to just respond to quickly was one about on reserve, off reserve. Um, if a First Nation um, has a housing organization that um, it wants to do housing off reserve, we can work with that First Nation for the on, off reserve uh, uh, project. And I'll use my community as an example. 
Um, I am a citizen of Hiawatha First Nation. Uh, we have a housing need in my community. That housing dollars that come to us from Canada through ISC are targeted on reserve, and we can only use those dollars on reserve. We're considering creating a, a nonprofit housing corporation uh, for a housing off reserve. And we would then be able to, um, we won't be red doing at this point in time because we're not there yet, but we would be able to uh, put an application forward under this particular initiative and look to find funding to be able to address a project we want to do off reserve. But we can't use this particular funding, the 281 and a half on reserve. That's what the $4 billion is for that was allocated in budget 22. I don't know what's happening with those four, that portion of the $4 billion that was allocated or targeted to First Nations. I don't know where that money is going, and I can't say whether or not it's being targeted on reserve or not, or specifically for housing or, or not anything of that nature. I can only speak to the 281 and a half, and unfortunately, it's not able to be uh, targeted to projects on reserve. So if it's an on-reserve issue or an on-reserve initiative, the issue is we can't fund uh, on reserve. Now, the settlement lands in the north, we are having conversations. We know that, for example, there are no reserves in NWT or Yukon. And so we're working with the First Nations in those areas to see where we can help uh, with their needs uh, with respect to projects they want to do in larger urban areas where they want to create um, housing or uh, shelter uh, supports in some of the communities like Whitehorse or Yellowknife uh, and working with them where they would be uh, looking to do the project for their nation, for their citizens, but not on their uh, on their set aside lands or on their settlement lands. Those are the things that will work closely with the First Nations to try and resolve some of those issues. Um, and I I think as I said uh, uh, from for Jamie's perspective about a couple of things, and maybe a, a, we might want to touch basically Jamie on the longer term. The the next piece is is. Uh, the 281 and a half, as I said, is for these two fiscal years. Our hope is that we're able to convince and show to Canada through the work that we do over this short term uh, with the 281 and, and a half, be able to demonstrate to Canada the need that exists, the need for the longer term funding, the need to ensure that there's a for Indigenous and by Indigenous approach to how that funding is spent, and that it's a national approach and one that brings all of the organizations and all, all of the needs together under one um, large organization or large um, um, vehicle um, through through uh, through the Nietzsche side of things. That's the position that we hope to be able to convince Canada to take, and that's the work that we're doing on the longer term. These discussions right now are just on the short term and what we can do over the next two fiscal years with a 281 and a half. And I don't know, Jamie, if you want to talk briefly about um, the work that's happening on a position paper, but other than that, I think we're, um, um, we'll start in a moment here and we'll turn it back over uh, to Laurent. But let's take a moment to talk about what work's been done on the position paper. You bet, thanks, Jeff. Um, so part of, part of this process, part of, um, part of what we've done is to speak to as many people as we can, government organizations, cities, um, and we took all of what we've heard uh, from their reports. I've read so many housing reports, um, and I, I captured it all in a in a position paper for why an urban, rural, and northern Indigenous housing strategy is key to ensuring that our Indigenous people that are living away from their traditional territories and homes is important. The position paper walks us through what's been done as a housing strategy and where the gaps and supports for Indigenous people living in urban, rural and northern areas are. It also takes a look at what it looks like in the future for Indigenous people living in urban, rural and northern areas. The position paper looks at um, what a, a for Indigenous by Indigenous approach would be and what a Phoebe Center would look like. So the Phoebe Center would be a centralized office or center that would have regional advisors and supports. It would um, support all indigenous people living in urban, rural and Northern areas across Canada in many ways of uh, job supports, education, um, employment, uh, 
and mostly and most importantly is connecting other services. Nietzsche is looking at a holistic approach when it comes to housing services and supports. We understand that housing is just not a home, that housing has to be supported for the whole person, the emotional, mental, spiritual, and physical side of, of a human being. And the position paper talks about that, that the connection between um, services and supports has to be a holistic approach, ensuring that it supports that whole person. And then the Phoebe Center will make that connection to those support services. Many times we use a siloed approach or we've been forced to use a siloed approach where, you know, if you have any mental health supports that you need, you have to go to building A. And if you have any addiction supports that you need, you have to go to building C. And housing is completely separate from all of this. And we're looking at this as it all needs to be connected. The whole person needs to be supported. And the position paper walks us through what that would look like. And the Phoebe Center itself will ensure that the regional advisors have connections to all of the support services. And when an individual calls in for support or is looking for some support, it will, the center or the advisor will actually have a list of all of the organizations and supports within that area or region and will help support that individual navigating through this. We know how hard it is to get access to some of these supports that we need. And sometimes it's just not reasonable to find a computer that we have access to that we can call these phone numbers and wait on hold and try and navigate the system. The Phoebe Center is to reduce that, that frustration. It's to connect the individuals to the services that they need and help support them all the way through their housing journey. And in the end, it's to ensure that the whole person is taken care of um, and ensure that they are supported 100% in, in all of the areas that they need. So uh, the position paper, I think, will be released in the next uh, couple of days. And um, I think it, a link will be on our website if I am, if I don't stand to be corrected. Um, and then once we go through this process and once we get through the allocations and we finish this portion, there's going to be a, a secondary paper that's gonna come out with what we've seen, what we know, and where do we go from here? So we'll take all the data and all the information and everything we've learned from this process and share it back. We want this process to be um, as transparent and supportive as possible for all Indigenous people across Canada. And when it comes to the application process and the entire way Nietzsche is doing things, we're hoping that people find this innovative and transformational and that they can use what we've done to continue to encourage the government to support the needs where they are and begin to allow us to speak for our communities and those that we serve because we know them best. Um, and I look forward to where we go from here. And I think we'll go to the questions unless Jeff has anything to add. I'm just gonna maybe respond to a couple of the questions, Jamie, that uh, that I've seen and we'll go through them. And and I know that um, they're being reviewed as we, as we talk now, but I wanna to touch on a couple of things. Uh, because one of the things maybe we should have talked about uh, as part of the beginning was defining what is an Indigenous organization or an Indigenous-led organization. Uh, an Indigenous-led organization is, well, first of all, the eligibility criteria is nonprofit, So it must be a nonprofit organization. It must be Indigenous-led. Uh, Indigenous-led being uh, at least 50%, uh, uh, more than 50% or more of the board is Indigenous. The majority of the leadership uh, of the organization is Indigenous, so that leadership would be the board, uh, executive or senior management levels, um, et cetera. And that would be the senior levels of, of the organization. Now, the majority of those are Indigenous. That this organization addresses the housing needs on a predominant basis for the three distinct groups, First Nations, Inuit, Métis. Those, that's the priority for them. Um, and that basically... Um, that the focus is on addressing urgent and unmet needs. We do not define urgent and unmet needs. We have our own ideas and the change that is different about this initiative is that we are looking to the projects and the organizations when they come in the door as part of the submission process to tell us what the urgent and unmet needs are. Um, so where are you on that housing continuum? Where are you with respect to the type of housing that you need? 
It could be anything from supportive housing, transitional housing, uh, to affordable housing, to um, to um, the, uh, uh, larger project of uh, affordable housing based on uh, the affordable housing criteria that's in place in your particular area. So it, it's, um, and I, I'm hesitating here because I'm trying to remember all the various definitions. That information will be provided in more detail on the website and it will be provided in more detail on the application process once that um, once that's put on the system. But um, the intent is it is for nonprofit. There was a question that's asked about can um, can for profit uh, partner with nonprofit. If the principal group coming in the door is an indigenous led organization that is nonprofit um, that is focused on addressing the urgent and unmet needs. Um, and is addressing uh, the urgent, uh, sorry, the indigenous uh, distinct, one of the indigenous distinct groups, and then they can partner with others to to uh, help them with their project. But the priority is to indigenous led and not priority, but the, the eligibility criteria requires uh, that it be an indigenous led organization with those uh, type of characteristics. Um, I noticed the other thing was about uh, another the question coming up about um, land based, uh, sorry, land list. First Nations and Halapu was the example um, that it could be looking for housing solutions in, in areas in Halapu with Newfoundland where you're looking at um, perhaps uh, some of the urban communities to try and find um, opportunities to put a housing project in one of those areas uh, that would act absolutely qualify for you. You don't. It's not the the funding is not going on reserve or it's not going on um, on lands that are uh, that are funded. Uh, specifically through Indigenous Services and Government of Canada. Those are some of the, the nuances that we have to work through with the particular applications when they come in the door to make sure that we understand them and that we can assess them in, uh, properly and fairly. Um, uh, I saw one that talked about um, three categories, and I want to mention again, it's not three, it's two. Uh, the first category is called um, um, Capacity and Organizational Development. Uh, up to $1 million. The second category is called capital development for over $1 million up to 10. So the capital uh, development could be for renovations, could be for uh, leveraging additional financing, uh, the 10 million, up to $10 million for those type of projects. Up to $1 million on the capacity side is for capacity and organizational development. It might be for some uh, modernization and improvement work that needs to be done. It might mean that there are things that are required from a capacity standpoint within the organization to keep the organization going and keep their project uh, going and viable. Uh, but all the funding is project based. Um, so we'll be looking at each project, looking at what it is the project is trying to do, is wanting to do, and what the funding can be used for in each of those two funding streams. Again, there is more information on that, uh, on, on, the, on the various um, um, classifications or categories. You'll be able to find that on the website under the allocation um, um, pieces or documents that are in the website, and you'll get more of that information uh, as well through the application itself and when the portal opens. Um, I'll stop talking there, and I think, JF, if you want to, um, you've been, I know, scanning some of the questions and trying to, um, to push them this way. So let me know what it is that you want in a way of, um, of an answer to questions. Maybe what I'll do while JF's doing that, I can just see one that talked about um, for-profit organizations. Uh, the, the eligibility requirement is it needs to be nonprofit. Um, that's, again, if, an, if a for-profit wants to partner with a nonprofit organization, that's fine, as long as it's the nonprofit organization that is coming in the door with the application and the nonprofit organization is the one making the submission. But a for-profit uh, organization um, wouldn't be um, acceptable or eligible under the criteria that have been established for the uh, for the program. Yeah, there are two questions here that I think I can answer pretty quickly. Um, so the funding is not specifically directed to supportive housing. It's um, it, it will it will be accessible to affordable housing as well. If we look at the housing continuum, we look at homeless, emergency shelters, transitional and community housing, affordable housing, affordable home ownership. So 
we're using the housing continuum to, to guide the process. What we want to be able to support is an Indigenous person all the way through the housing continuum. When we're looking at affordable rents or supportive housing, um, we're looking at rent supplements or, or whatever you decide or define as urgent and unmet need for your organization and for those that you serve. Um, and the approximate turnaround time for the application process, we're hoping we're hoping as quickly as possible. It's not going to be uh, months and months and months before you hear anything. We're going to, uh, we don't have a ton of time to do this process. So we're going to be as, as efficient as possible. And once the allocations are decided, then the process will be quite quick after that as well. So we'll just follow up with a few rapid fire questions to end uh, the session. Bear in, bear in mind that the full recording uh, of the session will be made available, including the slides, and we will also endeavor to answer all the questions that we may have missed today. So we thank everyone for their questions. Uh, Jeff, maybe this one can be for you. Does an organization have to already be involved in housing, or could it be an existing nonprofit that does not currently provide housing, but is interested in doing so? It can come in the door and make its application, yes. If it's a for an Indigenous-led uh, nonprofit organization, it can. Um, obviously, the, the focus of the project has to be to address urgent and unmet needs, and it has to be to address uh, the needs of those, those predominantly three, uh, the predominant needs of uh, the three distinct groups, First Nations, Inuit, and Métis. So uh, the short answer is yes. They would need to obviously make a good, strong case for what the project is they're trying to uh, to propose, uh, what the funding will be for, and um, and how they intend to be able to demonstrate the, the ability to meet or address those urgent and unmet needs. But yes, they can make the application. A follow-up question, can this funding be stacked with CMHC or other funding sources? Yes, uh, it, I, it, I mean, I don't know of any, uh, it wouldn't be us that, that disqualifies it, it would be the other funding program. And the Back one the funding, it might not allow um, the this. Sorry, pardon me. There, can the one to ten million in capital funding be applied for capital build shortfalls? If it makes, if the project is needs it to remain to be viable, if the project needs to, this is a grant, so it's a it's not a loan program. So if the if the program or the project sorry needs the um, the funding to be able to make the project. Or have the project continue to be viable? The answer would be yes. If it if it enhances or or assures its viability, the funding could be used for that. What are the timelines? When will the RFP be out? Turnaround time for approval, and when are the projects required to be completed by? Good question, and that's one of the ones I had in my list um, that we hadn't covered. Um, the portal, the application portal will open on November 24th. So you'd be able to go to the Nietzsche website, um, see the portal, um, and uh, open it up and all the application information will be there. The webinar two that we'll do on the 16th of November will be a walkthrough of what that process looks like, what the application looks like. So you have a, a good feel for what you'll see when the portal opens on November 24th. The portal will stay open for applications and will continue to take applications up to January 12th. And on January 12th, at the end of that day, the portal will close. The application process itself will have finished. Uh, during all of that time, and this is more of the information we'll go into on the 16th, during the time between the 24th and the uh, 12th of January, uh, a lot of work will go on with respect to the screening of applications, the back and forth with the proponents to make sure that all the information is there that the project has everything it needs to be able to uh, be assessed and be properly looked at. And, and all of that work will go on and during the period between the 24th of November and the 12th of January. When the portal closes on the 12th of January, there will be about a two week period after them, after then, where the proposals themselves will be uh, formally uh, assessed and finalized and reviewed by the advisory council. And the advisory council will put forth their recommended uh, list of projects to uh, to go forward. 
based on all the applications that have come through, based on the assessment, the scoring, uh, and as I mentioned before, the need to ensure that we're fair and equitable in the distribution of funding across the country. Uh, the intent and the hope is to have by the end of January, um, the formal announcement of all of the projects and the funding, and uh, and then work will begin at that point in time with um, um, the, the creation or the, 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 the signing of contribution agreements. And so with the with the successful proponents. So at that point in time, uh, our staff, we have four uh, and probably up to maybe six regional program funding advisors who will be working across the country with those proponents that are successful to help their get their contribution agreements signed, to help them uh, with their budgeting needs, to work with them uh, at a project level, to help make sure their project uh, continues to be successful, that they have all of their questions and their needs and their issues addressed. And so those funding advisors will be in place to help them do that. The funding advisors will also be in place at a community level to uh, work with um, other organizations who perhaps weren't successful in this particular call, but need maybe assistance or support to help them get ready for the next one and uh, to be able to uh, help them uh, at a development level if there's any particular needs or concerns that, that we can do to support them at that point in time. So those funding advisors will be on the ground at a regional level to be able to help um, those proponents, both the ones that are successful and the ones who are getting ready for another call at some other point in time. The call out for uh, November 24th is for all 281.5 million. So we're not doing it in separate tranches. We are doing a call out for the expressions of need for all 281 and a half. And uh, all 281 and a half will be allocated, um, assigned as at the uh, end of January. Um, I think, I'm trying to think that there was another, that just crossed my mind on timing, but when we get to the session on the 16th, we'll walk through all the various pieces of, uh, of, that, uh, of that application and what you'll be required to, to submit and what we'll be looking for and uh, what would be of importance to make sure that you, um, that you don't miss when you when you come in the door. I did mention that we'll be using the uh, CHTC, the Canadian Housing Transformation Center, um, and that uh, uh, the center itself will will play a, a large and supporting role in making sure that uh, we get the applications properly screened and assessed, and uh, are able to turn this around in in a short time. But um, uh, the the objective is by the end of January, all of this will be formally announced and all of it will be in place. Great, and uh, maybe a final two quick questions here. Um, this is a question that's come up a few times. Can this funding be used uh, in part or in whole to finance a land purchase? If it leads to a part of the project, yes. So in other words, if it's part of the overall project development, it's gonna to lead to, to the creation of a housing project, the short answer would be yes. Um, so I, we would need to see the proposal coming in the door as to what exactly it is the project is, or the, the group, the organization is proposing. What is their project? Uh, and if the project is to, um, and, and this is part of that ability to, to, make, to develop the project, to create the project, is the acquisition of the land, then it would be available for that. It would be eligible for that. A final question and then a word of uh, thanks for all involved. Um, is the funding for only in, uh, housing or do uh, other solutions like emergency shelters and group homes apply? Yes, uh, Jamie, did you want to clarify that? Because I think that was one of the questions that had come out of the hunting, housing continuum about emergency shelters and group homes, et cetera. But the answer, short answer would be yes, Jamie. Yes, um, if you take a look at the housing continuum, anywhere inside that housing continuum, uh, applies. So if you, as long as it's uh, supportive to urban, rural, and northern Indigenous people anywhere inside the housing continuum, then yes, absolutely. Um, but just further to that, if your organization has uh, two projects that they need support for, they have to submit two separate applications. They can't stack them inside one application. We would like them separate and, and uh, apart. 
Great. Thank you, everyone, for attending today. As I mentioned, the full recording will be made available. And most of the questions that we have uh, unfortunately didn't have time for, we'll uh, endeavor to answer those for you all. Um, Jeff, do you have any closing remarks? No, I just want to echo what you said and thank everybody for being part of this today. This is the first of uh, of the two, and I've mentioned it a few times, but it's also a learning opportunity for us to make sure that we're getting that feedback from you on the uh, issues and the questions that you have to make sure that we can uh, address those and answer those appropriately. A lot of this is happening uh, in uh, in 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 short time, and uh, but we're we are. Uh, are going forward with this in, in a very positive way and a lot of good work is done and we'll be able to meet your expectations and we'll be able to address your your concerns as quickly as possible. I'm very excited about this opportunity and I'm hopeful that everyone else is excited to be able to participate in it. It is unfortunate that we're not going to be able to address all the need and we know that with 281 and a half it's, uh, it's the first shot at this. We hope that Canada will be able to better understand the needs of Indigenous organizations, the needs of Indigenous people when it comes to their housing concerns in urban, rural, and northern areas, and the work that we do here over the coming months with your support and your participation will help to prove that in a, in a big, big way. So I'm looking forward to working with the organizations and making this a, a success in the coming months. Thank you very much for your involvement. This concludes our session. Um, you will get all the updates um, once again by visiting nietzsche.ca and you look to hear from us um, by email very shortly with the uh, materials that we've promised. You may also follow Nietzsche's social channels for more information. Thank you all. Have a great day.